Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back in particular to our two alternate jurors. Uh, so yesterday this jury uh, handed down verdicts in this case uh, of guilty uh, that Mr. Nathan Holden is guilty of first-degree murder of Sylvester Taylor under the felony murder rule, uh, that he is guilty of first-degree murder of Anglia Taylor under the felony murder rule, and that he is guilty of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill inflicting serious injury of Latanya Holden, and guilty of attempted first-degree murder of Latanya Holden. Because of those verdicts, uh, we now move, or in particular the first-degree murder, the two counts first-degree murder and the guilty verdicts associated with them, we now move to the penalty phase in this case. The first thing I'm going to do is have the clerk impanel you as jurors for this second phase of the trial, just as he, she did for the first phase, uh, and then I'll give you a very brief orientation about how we'll proceed, and then we'll move <coughs> directly into this proceeding. So, Madam Clerk. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been sworn and are now in panel to determine the punishment to be imposed in the state of North Carolina versus Nathan Lorenzo Holden. Sit together, hear the evidence, and render your verdict accordingly. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, in this second phase of the trial, you'll now consider the appropriate punishment to be imposed for these offenses, uh, and in particular the two counts of first-degree murder. Uh, that the jury returned a guilty verdict on. The choices that the jury will be considering with life without the possibility of parole, imprisonment, or the possibility of the death penalty. Uh, we're going to proceed exactly the same way we did in the first phase of this trial. In other words, we'll hear very brief opening statements, first from the state and then from the defense. Then we'll receive evidence, again, first from the state and then from the defense. Then there'll be closing arguments, and then uh, I'll instruct you on the law in this matter and then you'll be asked to deliberate. So exactly the same process that we followed previously. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move directly into the opening statements, and we'll hear from Mr. Lively on behalf of the state. Thank you, Your Honor, Counsel. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, first of all, I want to say thank you um, for the hard work you've already done, the evidence you've listened to, and the deliberations you've gone through are much appreciated. Um, but you haven't heard the whole story yet. You now know that the defendant killed Sylvester and Anglia Taylor, attempted to murder his wife, Latanya, with the kids within earshot a few feet away. Um, but that's not the end of the story. The defendant's violence was not confined to Lake Glad Road that night. It extended to Holden Acres, where he was living at the time when these crimes were committed. In the woods, in the dark of night, in the early morning hours of April 10th. Now, you know from the evidence that you've already heard that by 10 p.m. on the 9th, the Wake County Sheriff's Department knew who they were looking for. JT and Nautica and Amber, in the back of the police car, had told Deputy Evans, that their father, Nathan Holden, had shot their grandfather and their grandmother and their mom. And so the Wake County Sheriff's Department immediately began looking for him, sending out um, bolos, information over the radio, and attempting to pinpoint exactly where he was to bring him into custody safely. And they did um, a few hours later. What you're going to hear about today from the state is what happened in those hours between about 10 p.m. and about 3 a.m. the next morning. And what you'll hear is evidence from the Wake County Sheriff's Department. Investigator Inscore, who went into the house at Holden Acres once the search warrant was obtained, found a box of Win 380 um, cartridges, a box of ammunition um, with several cartridges missing that had been loaded into the gun, that had been fired eight times at Lake Glad Trail. And you'll hear from other members of the um, Wake County Special Response Team, the SRT unit, is how they're, is how they're um, known and how we'll refer to them. And what they did when they got to the scene, um, not of the crime, but, uh, but of the defendant's residence, and that they arrived there sometime before midnight, so 
a mere two hours after they had identified uh, Mr. Holden as the suspect in this case. They arrived at his house and they'll tell you exactly what they did and how they did it in order to efficiently and safely take the defendant into custody. Um, search warrant was obtained. Um, loudspeakers were used calling for the defendant to come out, identifying themselves as the Wake County Sheriff's Department. The defendant wasn't found in his house and after the search and after the clearing of several buildings on the property, uh, one of the supervising officers requested um, Deputy Simmons, who's sitting here in the courtroom today, to take his dog Duke and run a track through the woods in a final attempt to find the defendant. They had been there for some time at that point. And Deputy Simmons took Duke and along with him took deputies uh, Knunst and um, Manville and Brooks, and they set off through the woods behind the house there. Duke tracked through the woods to the west and came to an open field, and then to the north, continued tracking along the field, trying to pick up the scent of the defendant. Meanwhile, back at the scene at Holden Acres, a couple hundred feet away, the search is ongoing. The folks that have made entrance into the residence are starting to pack up. They're at this point collecting evidence and getting ready to clear the scene. When from the house where the loudspeakers had been calling out for the defendant, they heard gunshots, multiple gunshots. Again, this is the dark of night in the early morning hours of April 10th. They don't know where they're coming from or who's firing them. Deputy Simmons, Deputy Manville, Deputy Knutz, and Deputy Brooks will tell you that they got to a point in their search where they're going around the bend in the woods. Duke stopped. Deputy Simmons was holding Duke on his leash in his left hand, and in his right hand, he was holding a flashlight. When he stopped, he turned his flashlight, saw a man dressed in black raise his hand, and then the muzzle flashes. Deputy Simmons goes to the ground, fires returned. Again, you'll hear from the various uh, deputies that were out there uh, that they were essentially firing at where the, the muzzle was coming from. Um, once the Firing stopped. They all regrouped, checked to make sure that Deputy Simmons had not been hit. At this time, the rest of the SRT and several others were coming out to the scene, again regrouping, getting into tactical formation um, to attempt to take whoever was firing the shots into custody. And at that point, they get a light out there, a bigger light, and are able to flash and find the defendant on the ground without any injuries of his own, uh, with the gun mere inches from his hands. And they take him into custody without incident, and without wounding the defendant at all. You th you'll then hear some evidence from the defense, I imagine. And after all of that, Mr. Waller and I are going to speak to you about how to evaluate that evidence and why, you think, why we think you should find that the defendant's deserving of a sentence of death. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Mr. Brown. Thank you. Good morning. During the first phase of this trial, you decided that Nate Holden was guilty of two counts of first degree murder. As a result of that decision, we know that Nate Holden will be punished for the rest of his life, and that punishment is going to be severe. Now you must decide what form that punishment will take, whether it will be life imprisonment without parole of the death penalty. While you should remember what happened on April 9th and the early mornings of April 10th, this part of the trial will take a much closer look at Nate Holden's entire life. 
During the first part of the trial, you heard some about Nate's life before April 9th. You heard that he tried to be a good dad, that he loved his children, and how upset he was at the prospect of his family, of losing his family. But this part of the trial, you're going to hear a lot more. You will hear from those who knew him, from expert witnesses, and you will see documents that will show that Nate Holden is a lot more than what happened on April 9th. He is a lot more than the man who killed Mr. and Mrs. Taylor and who assaulted LaTanya. Nate is the son of teenage parents, Antoine and Nat Holden and Nathaniel Carroll. And while, without a doubt, many teenage parents do an incredible job raising their kids, these parents had a lot of obstacles and problems that interfered with their ability to raise Nate. You will learn that his mom, Antoinette, also known as Goldie, has dealt with severe substance abuse problems since Nate was born when she was 16 years old. She began drinking alcohol around the age of 10 years old and has had a drinking problem throughout Nate's life. At some point, as Nate grew older, alcohol be ceased to be the only problem. She also was having severe drug problems and began using crack. You also discover that she suffers, that his mom suffers from severe cognitive problems as well. Goldie and Nate's father, Nathaniel, lived together for decades, although never married, but it was anything but a smooth relationship. Nathaniel, the dad, regularly cheated on Goldie. In fact, when Nathaniel and Goldie were living together, Nathaniel had children with two different wo women. Goldie helped raise these children as part of the family that they lived in, but it caused a lot of tension in the family. Goldie would confront, as you can imagine, Nathaniel about his infidelity, especially when she'd been drinking, which was often. And Nate's two parents would have fights about it on a regular basis, but I'm not talking about arguments. They would have fist fights. Nathaniel Carroll would beat her up. Punch her, hit her. It would leave her bruised. And little Nate, as he was called, would know that this was happening. You will hear direct evidence about what it was like to live in a home where these beatings were a regular part of life. Nate was upset that his father was beating up his mother and wanted to do something about it, but there's not much he could do as a little kid. And he was upset about his mom's drug and alcohol problems. When he got older, he began to take steps to try to get her treatment. And you'll hear evidence that he actually, as a young adult, would take her to try to get treatment for these problems. Nate tried to overcome his past and the problems that it could have created in him. He told people he wanted to be different. He was going to put family first. He was not going to have children with multiple women. He was not going to be an abusive husband. And only a few years ago, it appeared that Nate was going to be living by these goals. As you've heard already, he married his um, middle school sweetheart. He only had children with one woman. He got his barber's license and did his best to make a means, a living means for his family. And you'll hear that his only criminal record before April 9th was for traffic offenses and a couple of misdemeanors. But like lots of marriages, particularly when people who marry as young as Latanya and Nate did, the marriages began to have problems. And Nate also had some other issues that were going on in his life. You will hear about him, the fact that Nate was assaulted in his home and pistol whipped in his home by four men in 2009. Added to this, the various reasons the marriage began to fall apart. And in part, because of all he'd been going through growing up, 
This caused Nate more problems than would have caused most people in similar situations. It caused him stress, sadness, and depression than it would, more than it would with other people going through such breakups. You will hear from expert witnesses in this case. You will hear from Dr. B John Blackshear, a psychologist, who helped explain the effects that all this had on Nate and its significance to this case and its significance on your decision about punishment. You also hear from an expert named James Aiken, who will explain that if Nate is given a sentence of life imprisonment without parole, the North Carolina Department of Corrections will be able to control Nate and that he will not be a threat in the future. You will be hearing the story of Nate Holden in this phase of the trial. And as a result of what happened in the first trial, what happened with, in April 9th and, what ha and your decision on the first phase of the trial, we know how the story of Nate Holden's life will end. He's going to die in prison. Now you will be given the decision to determine how he will die. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Evidence for the state. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, at this time, the state will call investigator Paul Lynn to his stand. I do. Thank you. Mr. Waller. Thank you, Your Investigator Inscore, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Will you please state your name for the record? Richard Inscore. And do you go by Paul? Your I do. Okay. Investigator Inscore, can you can you tell us a little bit about what your uh, your job duties are, sir? I'm assigned to the Persons Crime Division of the Wake County Sheriff's Office investigating major crimes. And do major crimes in the Wake County Sheriff's um, Department obviously encompass homicide cases? Yes, it does. And investigator in score, um, did you have a specific role um, regarding this case against Nathan Holden? Yes, I did. What was your specific role in regarding this case um, with Nathan Holden? On Wednesday evening, uh, April 9, 2014, I was assigned to go to the office to write a search warrant for 3536 Holden Acres Drive and for the vehicle and residence at 6800 Nightdale Eagle Rock Road. Uh, I had the magistrate to sign both of those warrants and then I proceeded out to the uh, Holden Acres location. And, and investigator in school, was that your, your first role in, in this case, sir? Yes, it was. And throughout the course of this investigation, did you become kind of assigned as, as I guess, the secondary investigator in this case? Yes. Okay. Well, um, Investigator Kenny Blackwell, seated behind me, he was the lead, and you, you assisted him in, in other matters? Yes, sir. Okay. When you responded out to, um, to Holden Acres Drive on um, April 9th of 2014, what did you know about the case at, at that point, sir? I knew that there had been... Uh, two people that had been uh, murdered and a third person that had been shot. And what was your duties there at, at Holden Acres that night? Uh, whenever I, I got there, I uh, let uh, the, everyone know that the search warrants had been signed and um, the, uh, my, my assignment was going to be to search the residence once the residence was cleared. Investigator Inscore, at this point, was it your understanding or the understanding of the Wake County Sheriff's Office, office that that is that was the possible location of the of the defendant? Yes. Okay. And did you know if he was in the home at that time or or outside the residence at that time that you responded? Uh, when I got there, the uh, SRT team was there and they were attempting to make contact with anyone who may have been inside the residence. When you say SRT, what what is the SRT team? special response team? So you had uh, you'd gone down the, to the magistrate's office and had you gotten a arrest warrants or just search warrants at that point? That was search warrants. Just search warrants and search warrants are what allows you to go into someone's home and and search for them and any other items of evidence that may be present. That's correct. Okay. Um, so do you recall approximately what time it was you got there, investigator in score? Well, the uh, warrants 
search warrants were signed at uh, 149 and 140, 144 and 149 in a.m. So it would have been after that uh, driving time from Hammond Road to that address. About how long did it take you to get out there, if you recall? 20, 30 minutes, something like that. So sometime around 2 o'clock in the morning. Correct. Okay. Uh, was the SRT team able to locate um, Mr. or the defendant, Nathan Holden, in the house um, when you were there on scene? No, sir. Okay. Um, after the SRT team tried to find him inside the house, um, did you then go, go about executing this search warrant that you had obtained that early morning hour? Yes, I did. Okay. Who else went into into the home with you, um, Investigator Inscore? Investigator Blackwell. Okay. And what was the purpose of searching the house at that point if y'all hadn't been able to find um, the defendant in the house at that point? To find any evidence that may have been uh, related to the murder at the um, Lake Glad Road. And I believe Investigator Barber testified in the first phase about a, a secondary search um, that occurred later that that morning is that right yes but this is something completely different this is still on the scene defendant hadn't even been taken in custody at that point that's correct okay. uh, tell us a little bit about how you went about searching that that residence there investigator in score well after the srt team cleared the residence uh, myself and investigator blackwell went in uh, to the residence i believe the first one room we went in was the back bedroom on the left hand side uh, we then proceeded to the bedroom, back bedroom on the right-hand side. And uh, when we were looking in uh, that bedroom, I was able to locate in the closet in a um, plastic drawer uh, container a, um, a uh, Winchester 380 uh, ammo box um, that had 32 rounds in it um, and we knew that, um, that those rounds that could possibly have been related to that uh, that shooting. Okay. So you, it was your understanding based on the ongoing investigation that was happening at Lake Glad that you were looking for, for 380 ammo at that point? Correct. Okay. And at that point you said this was I believe the right right bedroom, is that right? And on the back side of the house if you're facing the front of the house, it would have been in the house on the right back, back side. Okay. Now, when you, found, when you found this ammunition investigator in score, were you able at, at that point to, con, to continue on with the search? Uh, we started to continue with the search, and it was almost immediately after uh, I took those, that ammo out of the drawer that we heard shots fired. Okay. Could you tell how far away those shots were being fired? It sounded to me like within 100 yards of the residence. And what, once you heard these shots being fired, did your, I guess, goal or focus in the investigation change at that point? Yes, it did. All right. What was your role at, at that point once the shots began to ring out? I put the evidence down, and both myself and Investigator Blackwell, uh, he went out the back side of the residence, I went out the front side of the residence until we could determine uh, where the shots came from. Could you tell where the shots, in fact, did come from? To me, it sounded like toward the front of the house, back into the woods. Did you actually? Did you ever go out through the woods and in, into a field that night, investigator? In score? Not until after Mr. Holden was taken into custody. So you yourself weren't involved with the with the uh, apprehension of the defendant out there in the uh, out there in the field after after a gun shootout. No, I was not. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Did you let Lenny go yet? Investigator in score, I'm going to hand you what has been marked for identification purposes for the, the purposes 
of this sentencing hearing as States Exhibit S1. If you'll take a look at S1 to start with and tell, tell us if you recognize what that envelope is. Yes, it's the envelope that uh, Investigator Blackwell uh, placed the evidence in to put it into the evidence locker at the, um, at the Sheriff's Department. And what is the description that's given on the outside of the envelope as to, as to the contents of the envelope itself? Winchester 380 Auto Ammo. Investigator, this is where I'll ask you if you'll remove the contents of the S1. And I'll hand you a sticker labeled S2. Well, let me place, place S2 on the box. All right, if you'll take a look at State's Exhibit S2, tell me if you recognize what that item is. Yeah, this is the box that uh, was located in that little plastic container in the closet. And when you say it was in a closet, I think you said it, it was in a drawer within the closet. Can you kind of lay that out for us a little bit? It was like a uh, plastic rolling cart that has drawers. Uh, the, uh, it was in one of the drawers in that plastic that cart. Kind of like a Rubbermaid container or something? Something similar. Was there a gun located in that container along with the ammunition at that point? No. Okay. Um, did you see, we've heard about a holster and a gun cleaning kit. Was that there in that same um, compartment when you found, or found this item? I believe it was. I do not recall that. Okay. That's fine. But no gun was present no. at this point. Okay. In States Exhibit S2, um, does that box appear to be in the same or substantially same condition as when you seized it back on, I guess, April 10th of 2014 at this point? Yes, it was. Any changes or alterations? No, sir. Your Honor, at this time I would ask to introduce, introduce states, exhibits S1 and S2 uh, for this hearing. Any objection? Yes, sir. Allowed. Um, Investigator Inscore, when you were testifying a moment ago, you said that there were 38 live rounds still in the box when you when you opened it. 32. 32, excuse me. 32 live rounds within the box when you opened it on April 10th. Yes. If you'll open State's Exhibit S2 at this point, and if you can tell us um, how many live rounds are still present um, in that container at this point. Thirty-two. So all the live rounds that you found uh, on April 10th are still present there today. Yes. Now you said there's 32 live rounds present. How many, I guess, spaces are, are available there in that box for for other live rounds? Uh, there's a total of 50 holes. Okay. So essentially, 50 bullets could be held in this box. Correct. And if there are 32 still present, that means there are 18 that are gone. Correct. You described this as a 38 caliber Winchester, is that right? Yes. And then also, um, are the, is 38 caliber Winchester stamped on the bottom of one of those? 380. Excuse me, 380. Yes, it's a Win 380 Aldo. Okay. And the the box it describes as a full metal jacket. What, what does that mean, sir? It means the jacket around the the lead. It's full metal jacket around the lead portion of the bullet. Is, is that the type of um, bullets that you know, police officers have in their guns as well? Yes. I may have this two back, this one. Investigator and score those 18 rounds that were uh, that um, were missing missing from this box. Did you happen to see any loose uh, bullets there in that drawer or about the bedroom in any way? No, I did not. And if you'd have seen any loose bullets there in the drawer or around, is that something you would have taken note of and collected into evidence? Yes, sir. Right. Thank you, Investigator and score. I don't have any further questions. <clears throat> Cross examination. No, sir. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Further evidence for the state? Yeah. Your Honor, thank you. At this time, the state would call Lieutenant Byrd to the stand.
testimony you give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Thank you. If I may have just a moment. Yep. Well, will you please state your name for the record? Ronnie Bird. And Lieutenant Bird, how are you employed, sir? I'm a lieutenant in the Special Operations Division of Wake County Sheriff's Office. And is that the SRT unit that Investigator Enscore was just speaking about? Yes, sir. That's part of it. Can you tell us a little bit about what um, the special or what the special operations unit does, and then the special response team does? Special operations divisions encompass a lot of uh, drug and vice, canine, uh, DWI task force, interdiction team, and the special response team. And so you're the you're you kind of oversee all those different. I I'll oversee canine, DWI, and the special response team. Okay. All right, and tell us a little bit about what that special response team does. Special response teams like SWAT, we handle all the high-risk situations within the department, whether it be hostage rescue, you know, active shooters, uh, dealing high-risk warrants on homicide, barricade subjects, such as that. Anything high-risk that a normal patrol deputy wouldn't handle, we would handle. And do you have to go through some special training to be a part of that special response team? Yes, sir, you do. Okay. Tell us a little bit about what kind of training an officer has to go through to be part of that team. Initial training is uh, basic SWAT, uh, advanced firearms classes, uh, advanced SWAT, uh, hostage rescue school. Uh, every year something a little different. You go to repelling, less lethal. Uh, again, advanced shooting courses, uh, armored vehicle tactics. It's a lot to name. Uh, every year we continue to train and get uh, minimum hours we have to in order to keep our certifications. And Lieutenant, as a member of that special response team, are you given, or as an officer, does he have, I guess, additional equipment and, um, uh, I guess, officer paraphernalia that can assist him in these in these high risk situations? Yes, sir. We have a uh, uh, tactical entry vest with rifle plates to stop uh, rifle ammo up to uh, armor piercing. Uh, we uh, issue night vision equipment, our lasers for our uh, weapon suppressors. Um, we have robots, armored vehicles. Uh, again, we have a lot of uh, distractionary devices, less lethal devices, uh, a, lot, a lot of different equipment. And the, you said the canine unit is part of your the unit that you oversee. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. Tell us a little bit about how the canine unit works here in, here in Wake County. Uh, the canine unit uh, is assigned to special ops. They work more of a patrol schedule. Uh, yes. <laughs> So they're, they're, they work a patrol division schedule, but they're assigned to the Special Operations Division. So any time they would get a call, they would automatically respond. They help multiple agencies. Uh, they're usually one, they're working uh, from 7 in the morning to 4 in the morning. So there's some, usually one on call somewhere. They handle uh, lost children, uh, try to apprehend suspects that run from crime scenes, uh, drug detection. Uh, they're multifaceted dogs. Lieutenant Bird, you said that um, I guess the Special Operations Division and even SRT, um, they don't get involved in, in every apprehension of a homicide um, suspect, do they? Not every. It just depends on the situation. Okay. And back on April 9th and April 10th of 2014, did you as a lieutenant with this division have the opportunity to um, become involved in this case? I did. Can you tell the members of the jury a little bit about how you got involved in the case? Uh, that night, I'm not sure where I was patrolling, but it was only two of us workers, myself and Deputy Brooks, who's also in here. Okay. Uh, Deputy Brooks, is he a part of the special response team? Yes, sir, he is. Okay. We were riding double in, a, uh, I believe it was his vehicle, uh, just normal patrolling, helping out the, uh, any unit needed when the actual shooting call came out. We weren't even close to the scene, but we started driving that way. Uh, Took us a little while to get there because of the location we were in the county. Once we arrived at the initial shooting scene, uh, there was plenty of deputies there. They pretty much had the scene secure. Uh, wasn't a whole lot we could do. So we had somebody, somebody on the scene, I'm not sure who it may have been radio traffic, said that the suspect lived in the Raleigh Hill area. So I was very familiar with the area. I asked uh, Deputy Brooks, let's leave. We'll go over there and circulate the area and see if we can locate either the suspect vehicle or the suspect uh, somewhere driving around. 
So we proceeded to that general area, and then on the way there, another call came on the radio that said that the suspect lived on Holden Acres. I'm familiar with that area from having worked patrol there uh, early on in my career. <clears throat> so me and Deputy Brooks uh, went down Holden Acres, and as we were going down to Holden Acres, we noticed some headlights coming up behind us. <laughs> so we're not sure what's going on. I had Deputy uh, Brooks pull off to the side. We got out uh, with our guns drawn. We didn't know if the suspect was coming up. And uh, we approached the vehicle and uh, encountered uh, Nathaniel Carroll. Let me interrupt you just there, right there then. So you go to Lake Glad originally, yes, sir. where Ang Lee and Sylvester were killed. Um, and you get there and you say, there, there's enough enough people here. They've got this situation under control. And then I think you said you went to the, you heard that he may be, or the, the defendant may be from the Raleigh Hill or Raleigh Hill? Raleigh. Raleigh Hill. R-I-L-E-Y. And, and we've heard a little bit of testimony about Riley Hill during the course of this trial. What, where, where is Riley Hill? It's on the eastern side of Wake County. Uh, it's just a community, and it's basically the intersection of Edgemont and Riley Hill Road. And if you, you know most patrol deputies work, when you say Riley Hill, they they think of that specific intersection. There's a little store there. So it's kind of a crossroads area with yes, sir. General, what you probably maybe used to be called a general store. Yes, sir. Okay. And do you recall about what time it was that you heard the radio traffic identifying Holden Acres as the as the pot, potential location of the uh, suspect? Let me see here. It was probably around 10:30 that night. Okay. And on the at this point, we'd still be on April 9th. Yes, sir. <laughs> And so you and Deputy Brooks went, went to Holden Acres at that time? Yes, sir. Did you know um, the defendant or, or his, his father? You said this was an area that you were familiar with. Did you know them I did not personally? know the defendant, but I just have worked that area for so many years. I had uh, had a chance to encounter Mr. Carroll before. And I think you said you were beginning to tell us about that there was a car going down a path that, that you came, came upon. Yes, sir. We, we actually drove down the path first, Holden Acres, and we, uh, there's a couple houses there. We pulled up for the first house, and we noticed headlights coming up behind us. So we pulled beside uh, one of this little building house and got out and waited for the car to pull up and kind of approached the car with guns drawn. Can you tell us a little bit about that driveway there, Lieutenant Berg, kind of describe the, describe the scene for us a little bit? When you, when you turn off uh, Hodge Road onto Holden Acres, it's a long dirt path. Uh, you drive a little ways. There's fields on both sides, and you kind of, cut through a little wooded area, it's very short, and it snakes around for a while around another field. Uh, it's probably 400 yards long. And if you keep following it, you'll pass a house to your right, and then when you turn right beside that house, you would actually drive straight into the suspect's uh, front yard. Tell me approach the witness, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Uh, Hodge Road and then Holden Acres driveway, uh, which goes up toward the suspect's house. And is that an aerial photograph of the area, similar to, I guess, kind of a Google Maps aerial yeah. version? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. 
Um, but you recognize that road and does it fairly and accurately re represent that area? Yes, sir, it does. Your Honor, at this time I would ask to introduce States Exhibit S3 for illustrative purposes. Any objection? No, sir. Allowed. And permission for Lieutenant Byrd to step down and illustrate his testimony. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Byrd, I'm going to try and also pull this up on, on my computer. And Judge Ridgeway, is that on your screen? Yes, it is. If I, may pub if I may publish S3 on the screen as well. All right. Uh, Lieutenant Byrd, is that another view of the Holden Acres area? Yes, sir. Oh, all right. Now, if you'll kind of walk the members of the jury through where Hodge Road is and, and also where the driveway is that you, you saw this vehicle. Hodge Road is the paved portion down here in the lower right hand corner. And then Holden Acres is the dirt path that snakes through the wood, snakes through the couple fields to the edge of the woods and comes up and you have a couple of residents up here and a few abandoned houses over here also. Okay. And I'm gonna use the I guess the overhead projector at this point and um, I've got the cursor on, on Hodge Road. Does that kind of give you a, a general overview of where we are? Yes, okay, and then I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit. Holden Acres, it's labeled as Holden Acres Drive, but that's that's a dirt path. Yes, sir. And then here where I have the cursor, is that what type of little road or path is that? That's uh, just an access path for the farmers to drive on the field. Okay, so old farm road. Yes, sir. Okay. And then the can you either using the map there in front of you, or I can use the one here on the overhead. Um, you said there were some, the residences, are those residences back here where the map has 35, 36 Holden Acres Drive? Say again, sorry. Or is that where the, um, the houses are where it actually says 35, 36 Holden Acres Drive? Yes, sir. Okay. How many houses or buildings are back there, if you, if you recall? There's approximately five or six, okay. but only two were occupied at the time. That we could, uh, did you speak with anybody back? It almost looks like there's a little cul-de-sac back there. Did you speak with anybody when you were back there in the cul-de-sac area originally? Originally, no. Okay. Um, and when you first observed the vehicle, were you back there around the houses, or were you there on the on the um, path itself? We when we first drove in, we were still on the path, and we were close to this uh, bottom house here. And that's when we noticed headlights coming in. Kind of where the where it's pointed, right? Yes, where so the there's a house uh, right in front of that. Okay. And we actually pulled to the side a little bit, got out. Uh, I, I pulled out a submachine gun. Uh, I'm not sure what Deputy Brooks pulled at the time. We thought maybe the suspect was driving in the driveway at the time. Mm -hmm. And we jumped out and uh, we waited around the corner. And the minute Mr. Carroll drove up in his pickup truck, we approached him and identified who he was. Okay. Um, and at that point, did you have any information that Mr. Carroll himself was the suspect? Uh, we did have information about being that he was a suspect. Okay. Yeah, or not Mr. Nathan Carroll, but... We knew Mr. Holt was the suspect. Okay. So you, you, once you knew it was Mr. Carroll, it, what, there wasn't as much of a safety concern. Okay. And at that point, um, did you have the opportunity to um, speak with Mr. Carroll about, about what he was doing there? Yes, sir, and uh, also his, uh, his, I his wife or, uh, had pulled up also behind him in another vehicle. Okay, so there were two vehicles that yes, came sir. down the path. And I'm going to ask you about a little bit about what he told you, but bef before I have you return to the seat, um, this area behind, um, behind the woods, and, and it appears to be a field, did you go to that location at a, at a later point during the night? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, I may have you get back down in a minute, Lieutenant Bird, but if you, you can return to your seat now. Thank you, sir. All right, Lieutenant Bird, once you uh, you met the defendant's father, Mr. Carroll, there, kind of, kind of what, tell us a little bit about the conversation the two of you had there. I quickly interviewed him, uh, find out why he was here. He stated that his son, Nathaniel Holden, had caught him crying 
uh, told him that he loved him and for his dad to take care of the kids. And uh, Mr. Carroll was worried about his son hurting himself, and that's why he said he was there. Okay. Um, so did, in your conversation with Mr. Mr. Nathaniel Carroll, um, did, did it appear to you that he knew whether or not his son was there at that house or not? Uh, I think he, think he knew he was there. He was cooperative, he was cooperative with us. Uh, I don't think he knew what he had done at the time. Uh, but yeah, I think he didn't know he was there. Okay. After you, um, did you secure Mr. Carroll there at the time or was he? We, we kept him and his wife there uh, while we tried to get additional units there. We didn't secure him. Uh, we just helped him, said don't leave type thing. You know, he wasn't placed in handcuffs or anything like that. Once you learned that this was a, I guess, a very a realistic possibility that this defendant was at this residence, what did you do, Lieutenant Bird? Uh, immediately got on the radio, called for additional units, which at the time was, uh, were, was kind of spare, sparse because most of the units were still on Lake Glad Road. Uh, because I thought he may be in the location, I wanted to set up a perimeter around the house as quickly as possible. And at the same time, uh, I'm having Deputy Brooks call the on-call uh, SRT guys out uh, to the scene also. You said a perimeter. What do you mean by a perimeter? Perimeter is uh, setting up uh, a 360, basically circle around the structure uh, to keep eyes on, make sure nobody comes in or goes out from that area, make sure uh, secure for law enforcement. And can a perimeter, the, the size of a perimeter, can it kind of expand during the course of an investigation? Yes, sir. It can go further out or come further in or close in. And you said you had Deputy Brooks call for the for the SRT members. Um, what what kind of triggered you at this point to say, hey, this may be a high risk scene that we we need those guys to come in? Based on what had happened on Lake Glad Road, uh, based on the information I received uh, when I talked to Mr. Carroll about his son possibly in the house, uh, it was a, a dangerous situation for everybody. And based on you know my knowledge and experience, uh, it could turn violent really quick and my guys are highly trained and it was you know it's what they trained for all the time and it was uh why i called them out what ha what happened at that point lieutenant bird did everybody respond <clears throat> yes sir uh well initially we had uh some patrol units from the interdiction team show up to help set a perimeter around the house because only two of us a lot of them had to travel from different parts of the county so it took quite a while for them to get there uh once they got out there we set up a little better perimeter uh, we got an armored vehicle out there. Uh, we waited, uh, <coughs> trying to wait for the search one to get there before we made entry into the house. But initially, once everybody got there on the team, we came up with a game plan. We were going to, uh, we have a perimeter set up. We're going to get on a PA system and try to start calling the uh, suspect out of the house. So you were doing that even before investigator in score arrived? Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about this um, this armored vehicle that you said that you called for. What is that? Armored vehicle, it's a Bearcat made by Linko. It's uh, bullet rated up to a 50 cal. The windows are bulletproof. Uh, it has a uh, loudspeaker built into it. It has blue lights on it. It has a, uh, a ram. We can actually put a hydraulic ram put on the front of the Bearcat to where we can breach a door safely without putting anybody in harm's way. Also has a uh, gas injection port. We needed to put some kind of uh, gas inside of a house without putting anybody in harm's way. We can drive up, poke it through the wall, and inject gas into the house. And Lieutenant Detective Inscore just testified that he was seen around 2 a.m. Uh, we to try and call Mr. Holden out um, prior to 2 a.m. Yes, sir. I think it was approximately... Let me get it right here. 15 when uh, we actually moved the Bearcat up to a position, uh, a tactical advantage to where we could call the suspect out of the house. And you said this this um, piece of equipment has a PA system on it. Yes, sir, it does. Uh, and you're calling out the the defendant at that point trying to get him out of the house? Yes, sir. You recall what exactly you're saying? How are you identifying yourself? That kind of stuff? Normally it's the same routine. We'll get the suspect's name. So this is the uh, Wake County Sheriff's Office. Uh, come out with your hands up. You'll not be harmed. Uh, we continue to relay that over and over and over again, uh, and according to the kind of the time frame of here, we probably did it for about 45 minutes off and on before and score arrived back with the yes, search sir. warrant. This PA system, how how loud is it? It's very loud. Okay, and we were pretty close to the house also. Okay. So it's something that not only people there, I guess, actually in Holden Acres could hear, but I 
potentially even out to Hodge Road. Yes, sir. All right. May I approach the witness again, yes. Your Honor? Lieutenant Byrne, I'm going to show you a group of photographs labeled states um, S4 through S7. Can you take a look at those photographs and tell me if you recognize what those pieces of equipment are? Yes, sir, I do. And what are those pieces of equipment? They're a picture of the Linco Armored Bearcat and our robot that we use on the team. Okay. And do these photographs fairly and accurately um, describe that Bearcat or depict that Bearcat and also the robot? Yes, sir. Your Honor, this time I would ask to introduce State's Exhibits S4 through S8 for illustrative purposes. Any objection? Yes, sir. They are allowed. And permission to publish those photographs to the members of the jury? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Byrd, I believe this is State's Exhibit S8. Is that what you have on the back of that photograph there, sir? S4. That's S4. Okay. State's Exhibit S4, can you kind of describe for us what you see there? Yes, sir. That's the actual front end of the uh, Linko Bearcat. Uh, you can see the two white lights there. That kind of uh, helps, out, helps us out at night. We attach this uh, ram to the front, and blue lights on the front also. Uh, we'll have on the very top, you see left and right, the uh, little lights at the top. They're uh, lights that help us uh, shine down on house, identify uh, the structure in a dark situation. And then the long thing you see uh, attached to the front bumper with the uh, flat piece is actually a hydraulic battering ram. We can raise it up and down uh, depending on the height of steps, and we can drive up to a front door and just slowly push it open. And that way it keeps the operator from having to go up there and be in harm's way. And the speakers that are kind of used to, by the PA system, are they, are they depicted on this photograph? Yes, sir. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, the little black round speakers should be to the left and to the right of the little small blue lights at the front bumper. Right here where yes, the sir. cursor is? Yes, sir. Okay. And so those are the speakers you were using that, that night? That's correct. Okay. Um, let me show you a few of the photographs of, is that, I believe that may be S8. Yes, sir, that is. Okay. And that just a side, side view there of, of the Bearcat. Yes, sir. And then S5, I believe, is this the rear, the rear of the Bearcat? Yes, sir. Okay. It also appears to have have those blue lights and, and search lights as well. Yes, sir. Now, this should be S6. S6. What do you see there, sir? That's the back side of the uh, Bearcat with the doors uh, propped open, and that's normally where the team would uh, exit in order to either make entry into a house or get into a different position other than the Bearcat. How many, um, how many officers can fit in the back of the Bearcat here, sir? Uh, probably around 12. We usually don't have that many working at the time. but Who was, um, who was in the back and, and in the Bearcat with you when you – uh, approached the house there at Holden Acres that night? Uh, it was Deputy Canoes, Deputy Woodliffe, Deputy Brooks, Deputy Eagles, Deputy Mistretta, Deputy Hinton, and uh, I'm not sure if Deputy Simmons was in the back with us or not. I can't remember. But he was there anyway. And Deputy Simmons, what what's his role within the Special Operations Unit? He's a canine handler. And then you mentioned that Part of what your team does is, is use a robot. This should be State's Exhibit S7. What do you see there? That is the team's robot that uh, we use on high-risk searches. Uh, instead of sending uh, a person in the house, we possibly have an armed suspect, we'll send the robot in first. It has a camera on it that transmits back to a uh, 
a control box where we can visually see what's inside the house prior to sending somebody inside. So in, in terms of kind of where we are on the timeline, you, you and the other members of the SRT, you're in the Bearcat sitting directly out in front of the house at this point? Yes, sir. Normally what we would do is when we start calling them out, we would have, we'd form what's called an arrest team. So we'd have some guys out back with long guns covering down on the house. And then should somebody come out, we'd have a dedicated arrest team that would give them commands, where to go, what to do, and we'd take them in custody. And that, that's what we had at that point while we were trying to call them out. So for 45 minutes, there's the arrest team is outside the vehicle. You're inside the vehicle making the calls. And after 45 minutes, about 2 a.m. is when NSCORE come, Detective NSCORE comes back with the search warrant. Yes, somewhere in that area, sir. And so with the defendant not coming out of the house up until that point, what did you and your team decide to do? Uh, you know, we get, I think 45 minutes was plenty of time to try to get somebody to come out with uh, calling a PA. So once the search warrant got there, we, we backed the Bearcat out a little bit, put it in a, a safe position where we could get out, and then we attached the ram that was in the picture on the front of the Bearcat. This, the ram here? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and at that point, did y'all, you know, change into your tactical gear and, and begin that process? We were already fully tacked out prior to that point. Uh, so all we had to do was attach the ram. We told everybody, we got on the radio and said, hey, we're getting ready to push the door open. Uh, just be prepared. Uh, I drove it up there. We popped the door open and waited to see if we got any reaction. Called out a few more times, still no reaction. Uh, then we made a decision to send the robot in. Okay. To search the house. And this is the robot that, that you sent into the house? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so when you popped the door open, nobody, nobody came out at that point. And then the robot. Tell us a little bit about how that was utilized to, to clear the house. So we'll send the robot in. Uh, it'll go in each room, kind of take a 360 view of it, see if there's any feet hiding anywhere under beds, on top of beds. Uh, if there's closets open, we can search in there. It has both a regular white light and IR light camera, so it can still work in uh, darkness. Uh, so we sent the robot to each room, trying to locate anyone that may be in the house. Uh, we searched everything, and uh, the robot found no one inside the house. Do you have um, what time, or do you recall what time it was after the robot had cleared the house and y'all determined there was, there was no one in there? Uh, it was approximately 2.23. That's when we actually uh, sent the team in to clear it uh, uh, with bodies. Okay. So somewhere between 2.20 and 2.23 in the morning. So after you send the robot in, there's an all clear, then you... At 2.23 a.m., you sent actual actual deputies in. To yeah, we sent the uh, tactical team in, yes, sir. And are you continuing, um, while this is going on, Lieutenant Bird, to call out for the defendant on, on the loudspeaker yes, as sir. well? Okay. So after, um, after it was determined no one was in the house, what did you decide to do at that point, Lieutenant? We, uh, we, we pulled everyone back out, the tactical team back out. We released the house to the investigations uh, personnel on the scene. Uh, then we grouped together and uh, talked with uh, Deputy Simmons, and it was Deputy Brooks, Canoost, and Manville, and had them take the canine to the back of the house, see maybe he had slipped out before we knew, uh, before we got a perimeter set up, and uh, see if we could track anything back there to the woods. So it was, I guess it was kind of your call, your decision to send to send the, the officers out there? It, probably between me and Sheriff Harrison. He's, he's, was he, he, he was he present was on the scene? Yeah. Okay. Um, so... Was there any indication at that point that Mr. Holden, the defendant, was out back, or were you just at this point trying to, to continue your search for him? Just trying to continue our search. And you've kind of shown us the vehicle. What's the, I guess, what's the situation out there in terms of lighting? Did, did, you, did you feel like it was a safe situation at that point that y'all had it under, under control, or was this still, I guess, a high-risk area? It was still a high-risk area. The house we felt comfortable with. Uh, and that just the immediate surrounding of that house. Uh, beyond that, it was still wide open. We had no idea, and you know, we didn't know if he was actually there, left, there, went out the back door, never showed up. So we were still treating it as an armed suspect somewhere nearby. And, and in, I'm going to pull the the overhead photograph up again. I mean, it appears from from this photograph and your testimony that woods were surrounding this this entire area around around the houses itself. Yes, sir. And I think you mentioned at some point that there was uh, potentially one other person in the in the area. 
was there a lady there? Yes, sir. As soon as you put on Holden Acres, there's a house to the right. There's an elderly female that lives there. Uh, before we even went to uh, the suspect's house, we uh, got her out, put her in a uh, vehicle, and got her a safe area while we conducted our uh, operation. Right. Um, Lieutenant Bird, what time was it when, when you um, dispatched uh, Deputy Brooks and the other members of the SRT team to, to do this canine search? Uh, probably around 2.35. And at 2.35, um, can you tell us kind of how, where your station was and what you remember happening at that point? So we had cleared the house, so part of the job is to make sure we collect all our equipment. We got everything we came with. So while they were searching the woods behind the house, the team left over taking the ram apart, stowing it back on the vehicle, putting the robot up, uh, making sure whatever equipment we had, you know, we didn't leave behind at the house. And what happened while you were, I guess, um, kind of <coughs> disassembling your, your unit there? Well, while we were disassembling, all of a sudden we heard uh, multiple shots ring out in the woods. I immediately got on the radio trying to check their status, see if they were okay. I didn't get a response. Uh, I wasn't sure what was going on. I knew the direction they had left with the dog behind the house. So I told the rest of the remaining SRT guys there, I said, come on, let's go. So we took off running behind the house through the woods trying to locate where they were at. What was your concern at, at this point, Lieutenant Bird, when you hear these shots and fairly close proximity and then you don't hear your guys answering the radio? I was uh, afraid they may have been shot. They, they're going in a dark wooded area. You know, they're making noise traveling through there. They, you know, everybody knows we're already there and you know, we have no idea where the suspect's at. So when I heard that, I, I thought maybe they had been ambushed. Okay. And um, when was the first time you heard from your, from your guys and them saying that they were okay? Uh, I think it's when we actually made exit from the woods to the edge of the field. Okay. Right, let me kind of, if I, if I may, and we'll just use the, we'll use the overhead. So what, what direction of travel did you take to, to find where, where the other SRT members were? So where the suspect's house at, we went behind it and, and went, if uh, straight. top of the screen's north, we went due north. Okay, so you went straight through this wooded area here? Yes, sir. Okay. And where approximately did you come out of the um, of the woods? It was probably a, a little left of your cursor, okay. somewhere in that general area. This area? Yes, somewhere, somewhere in that area. I mean, okay. and when you came came through the wood line, how many other officers did you have with you at that point? I believe it was four more of us. So I believe so. And when you entered this this field here, sir, what was I guess if you can kind of describe for us what what the scene was when you I guess came out of the woods. When I came out, uh, I believe it, was, it might have been Deputy Brooks I first encountered, and uh, Deputy Knust, and they kind of gave me a lowdown. Hey, he shot us from that general area. Uh, I couldn't see him at the time. Uh, at that point, uh, Deputy Manville and Deputy Knust kind of flanked out into the field to get kind of an angle of fire on him. So we have multiple angles of fire, and then. Uh, they threw the lights on and we saw uh, someone laying down on the ground on their back. So when you and your, uh, those other four deputies go um, clear the woods and get into the field, he's, uh, the defendant's still not in custody at that point? No, sir. I, I don't even know where he's at at that point. How dark was it out there? It was pretty dark. Um, I don't remember if the moon was out or not, but it was, you know, we went from a lighted condition to dark, so our eyes hadn't even adjusted yet. And what happened when, as you were you and the other SRT members are, are locating the suspect. When we get out there, uh, once Deputy Manville and Canoose kind of flank out, uh, we turn the weapon lights on, we see him laying down. Uh, we decide to approach the suspect, so all of us move together as a team up to him. Uh, we find him laying down on the ground on his back, uh, his right hand stretched out, and just outside of his reach of his hand is a small pistol. How close was that pistol? A couple inches. Do you recall what type of pistol it was? Uh, semi-automatic, but I, I don't remember the color at the time. I was more focused to make sure he didn't do anything crazy uh, at the time. I didn't know if he was hit or not hit. His eyes were closed. He was not responding to commands. I assume somebody had shot him. Yeah. Where all the SRT members, were they, they okay when you arrived in terms of not being hit? Yes, sir. Okay. Once, I think they did a self-check on themselves in the field right after the initial incident. And then once we got up to where the suspect was laying down, we determined he wasn't hit. We secured him. Then I had uh, we do a buddy check on each other, make sure nobody got hit, and adrenaline was pumping, and we just didn't realize it. You going back to the defendant? You said he was 
Um, he was not responsive to your questions at any point. Did, did he say anything to you? No, sir. Okay. And kind of just describe for us a little bit, when you say non-responsive, what, what do you mean by that? How was he acting when y'all found him, when you saw him there in the wood line? Like he had fainted. I mean, just, we, we were like, Sheriff's Office, don't move, don't move. You know, trying to give him commands, no commands. We had to physically uh, roll him over and handcuff him. I mean, there was just like a limp person. Okay. Was he was he conscious though? His eyes were closed. Uh, I I don't know if he was conscious or not. To be honest with you. And did you have him him checked out as well by EMS and to make sure he was that he was okay? Yes, sir. Immediately once we secured him and considered the scene fairly secure, we called EMS around to the field. They drove a. Uh, uh, one of their trucks around and checked him out and didn't find anything wrong with him. And did you have um, kind of some transport responsibilities regarding the defendant that night? Yes, sir. Uh, since I drove with Deputy Brooks, uh, my vehicle was downtown. So I, along with Deputy Woodliffe, uh, put him in one of our uh, SRT vehicles and transported him downtown for investigations. And during the course of that trip, he didn't make any spontaneous statements to you? No, sir, he did not. May I have just a moment, sir? Yes, sir. Questions, Your Honor? Cross-examination. Um, yes, just briefly, Your Honor. Um, you said that you talked with um, Mr. Holden's father, Nathaniel Carroll? Yes, sir. And he expressed concerns that his son might try to hurt himself? Yes, sir. And he said that, and you were under the impression at that point he didn't know exactly what had happened on Lake Glad Road? Yeah, I was under the impression he did not know. Okay. And just, and... None of the, your officers checked each other and checked themselves, and nobody had been injured? Correct. And you checked um, Mr. Holden, and he had not been injured as well? Uh, well I had EMS check him out. Okay. And yeah. there was no bullet wounds, anything with him? All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Redirect. No, you're just going to step down. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Further evidence for the state? Your Honor, this time we'll stay with call of Deputy Mantle to the state. I solemnly swear the testimony you give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, ma'am, I do. Thank you. Mr. Waller. Thank you, sir. Uh, Deputy Manville, good, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Will you please state your name for the record? Brad Manville. And Deputy Manville, how are you employed, sir? I'm an investigator with the Wake County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been an investigator with the Wake County Sheriff's Office? Uh, a little over two years now. Two years. Uh, going back to April 9th and 10th of 2014, where, what were your duties at that point, sir? I was assistant team leader assigned to Special Operations Division, SRT. Okay. Um, so did you work with and, and, I guess, under Lieutenant Byrd? I did. And were you assigned just to the SRT team, or did you have other responsibilities within the Special Operations Division? I was just on the SRT team. Okay. And could you tell us a little bit about kind of what your, your general duties are in regards to being a member of the, the SRT team? Uh, to respond to critical incidents like Lieutenant Byrd advised, 
Uh, we do a lot of training to prepare for those incidents and attend certain training in different areas and environments to, to make us better capable to handle those situations. Can, can you tell us um, how long were you on, were you on the SRT team? Uh, I transferred from K9 to SRT in 2011, I think. Okay. So at, at the time of this incident, you had been on there about about three years. Yes, sir. And about how many different call how many calls a year do y'all go to where where your assistance is needed? I wouldn't have an exact number for that, but approximately 20 to 25 calls a year, probably, okay, if so, not more. Okay. But not something that even even happens every every week. No, sir. Um, kind of try save that for high risk situations. Yes, sir. That's all, that's what we're used for. Okay. All right, um, Deputy Manville, thank you, sir. Um, turn, I want to turn your attention specifically on to April 9th and April 10th of 2014. Did you have the opportunity to come into um, come into uh, contact with the defendant in this and this case on on that date, sir? Yes, sir, I did. What were the circumstances in which you were alerted to to this case? Uh, it was I think about 23:30 or 11:30 at night. And uh, Deputy Brooks contacted me and advised me we we're being called out for a, a, to attempt to locate a homicide suspect. And I think Lieutenant Bird said that the standby team was called in. Were you on right, standby? The on call team, yes. On call team. So were you at your house that night? I was sleeping. Okay. So you got called in um, to this around 11:30. Yes, sir. And where did you report to, sir? Uh, Hold Nakers. Okay, you went. You went directly there. Yes, sir. There was a staging location there. And what happened once you once you arrived to at Holden Acres? Uh, as we began to gear up, because it was still a hot scene, uh, I was being briefed by Deputy Brooks and some of the other deputies that were on scene about what the uh, circumstances behind the case were. Okay. When you say a hot scene, what is why what does a hot scene designation mean? It is not secure. And what what kinds of things make a situation not or scene not secure? <clears throat> well, that particular scene, it was dark out, so you, the visibility was low. Uh, the woodland areas and structures in that area had not been cleared or secured, so there was not enough personnel to do all that until we arrived on scene. And at that point, when you arrived, was the suspect still at large as well? Yes, sir, he was. <coughs> what What were your general duties and responsibilities after Deputy Brooks um, caught you up to, as to what was going on out there? Uh, at that point, I was assigned to the shield and uh, was staged in the... Well, initially, we cleared all the structures around the uh, possible target location to verify that he was not hiding in one of those. And then once we fell back to uh, the target house, uh, I was assigned to the shield in the back of the Bearcat. What is the, what is the shield? The uh, shield is a ballistic bunker that the first man through the door carries. Okay. And so like the photographs that we saw a few moments ago when the, when the doors to the back of the Bearcat, Bearcat open, are you the first person through? Yes, sir. Okay. And there's a shield there that you that you carry in going. Yes, sir. When that happens, um, Lieutenant Bird just kind of described for us about the process, about him calling out for the defendant, and then the approach of the house. Uh, where were you while while this was happening? Uh, during the call out, I was staged on the back uh, side of the Bearcat. Uh, once the call out, we received a search warrant, and we decided to send in the bear, the uh, robot. We stood by there while the robot made an attempt to clear the residence. Uh, I mean, it's it doesn't see everything in the residence, so it's not entirely clear when you go in there. I think the robot actually uh, ended up stuck in one of the rooms. So uh, at that point, Lieutenant Purdy gave us the order to go in and physically clear it. And were you the first person off the truck and, and into the house? Yes, sir. What, if anything, did, did you find when you went in, in there to the house? Uh, lights were on in the residence in some rooms. Uh, it appeared to be normal. I didn't see any signs of anything unusual. Uh, as we cleared the structure, we didn't locate any personnel. And at this point, Deputy Manville, your your sole purpose is to look for people. Is that right? Yes, sir. You're not going in to collect uh, collect evidence. No, that. sir. We don't do that. Okay. So Deputy Inscore, Detective Inscore, and his his folks follow up and do that later on. Yes, sir. Okay. Once you once you got the all clear or um, cleared the residence. What did you do then, sir? Uh, we returned back to the Bearcat to wait further instructions. <coughs> wait for what, I'm sorry? Wait further instructions. And who, who was kind of in, in charge out there in terms of um, telling you and your members of the team what to do? Lieutenant Bird's the team commander. He makes all decisions in tactical environments. So stand by for him. And in tactical environments. And after, um, 
At that point, did Lieutenant Byrd give you some instructions? He, uh, through Deputy Brooks, he said we were going to assist the canine unit in doing a search of the wooded area around the residence. And approximately what time did, did, this, did this search begin, sir? Probably a little after 2 in the morning. Okay, 2 a.m.? Yes, sir. And who all went with you in the search of the, the outlying wooded areas? Uh, Deputy Simmons was the assigned canine. Uh, was myself, Deputy Brooks, and Deputy Knust. Are when you say that um, Deputy Simmons was the assigned canine officer, were we all there kind of for protection of of him, or how did that situation work? Yes, sir. We provide security for him while he does his uh, canine track, and as well as assisting in apprehension if that happens. So he, you were essentially the cover for the for the dog out there. Yes, sir. And for Deputy Simmons. Okay. Tell us a little bit about how you recall the track going. Uh, we entered the wood, wooded area behind the residence. And if I'll pull up State's Exhibit S2, S3 at this point again, using the overhead projector. If you can, kind of walk us through how, how you travel, Deputy. <coughs> if you uh, see where the residence is located by the map, we entered the woods directly uh, up from that, from your cursor. Yes, sir in that area and we did a uh, kind of a curving to the left through the wood line and came out uh, down there if you, if you notice that trail uh, see the little square at the bottom left hand side of the screen it looks like a path or a field that goes up to the right that's actually a power line this right area yes sir okay and we came out just a little bit up from where your cursor is uh, into the open field area okay so in this in this general area here yes sir in that area <clears throat> and it appears that the power lines run uh, over the field, I guess, in a, in a north direction. Yes, sir. Okay. So when you come out in this area, if you can kind of describe for the members of the jury what, what the scene is, is that, that you see there. Uh, we come out in the field, uh, and Deputy Simmons is, <laughs> is still attempting to obtain a track. Uh, we begin to push along the, the wood line to the right there. Uh, it was Deputy Simmons a little bit away from the woods. I was slightly back and to his right, and then Deputy Knust was to my right, and Deputy Brooks was to my left a little bit behind me. And so you, it appears there's a, a power line tower right here, and you come out around. I, I guess this is, is this another farm path here? Yes, sir. And are you all pretty much tracking on that path? Yes, we came out into the field, and we, uh, we were a little bit off of the path into the field as we were traveling to the right. Okay. Um, all right. What what happened at that point, Deputy Mamble? Uh, we saw an opening in the wood line and uh, some something we didn't recognize was some different colors. It's nighttime and we didn't weren't able to see. There was a moon, but it wasn't uh, enough to be able to make out everything. So we moved to that area to see what the, uh, the items we saw along the wood line were. It turned out to be a trash pile. Uh, at that point, I could tell we were coming back around toward the uh, front field and assumed it. Uh, we were probably coming to a conclusion. I asked Deputy Simmons, I said, do you have a track or have anything? And at that point, he said no. Uh, so we took about three more steps, and then that's when uh, Deputy Simmons saw something on the wood line. Okay. And so you said that you were about to the point where you were going to discontinue the track. Was that right? Yes, sir. We were going to work. Uh, if he didn't have anything at that point, we were just going to work the field's edge or the wood line edge back to the the uh, staging area. So essentially you were going to backtrack where you just came from? Not, no, not backtrack. We were just going to continue on up to the path, the farmer's path, and then back to the vehicles. Okay. All right. Um, and when you saw the trash pile, can you tell, use this map and tell us like, approximately where that trash pile was? Uh, there's a lot of shadowing in that. A lot of that black is shadows from the, from the trees. But if you go up to your right slightly, right about there, there's an opening there. That's about where the uh, trash pile was. Okay. And you search that trash pile and don't find anything there. Yeah, Deputy Canoose, well, Deputy Canoose was closer to me. He kind of investigated it, determined it was nothing, and that's when we started to continue. Now, it, it appears from this photograph, and I know with the shadows it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but it appears that this, this wood line does curve a little bit. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, can, tell us a little bit about that. Are, we, are you able to just kind of look straight on, or do you have to... You know, does do the trees encumber your vision? So they encumber your vision. So from where your cursor is, if you were uh, pretty much what you could see is there's trees across the field. If it was daylight, that's what you would be able to see. But with uh, obviously with nighttime, you can't. You could see slightly into the field, but you could not see 
anything to the right, like where you see that farm trail come up to the right in the bottom right-hand side of the screen, that was all out of view. It was around the corner okay. of the field's edge. So you weren't able to see this path? No, sir. You couldn't see any of that. Okay. So you could, when you say you could see some trees, were you referring to these trees? Yes, yeah, so you can see out in the field that direction. That's about as far to the right as you could see. Okay. But there, these trees actually kind of uh, curve out, for lack of a better word, and obstruct your view down down this path. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, I think you, I interrupted you where you said that Deputy Canoose, um cleared the trash pile, and then Deputy Simmons um, alerted alerted what happened. At that point, we were starting to walk again. Deputy Simmons had turned on his flashlight and uh, said something. I couldn't hear what he said, and then I heard a shot ring out. <clears throat> could you tell where that shot was coming from, sir? Yes, sir, I could. I could see the muzzle flash. It was directly around the corner, almost where your cursor is. Okay. So around the bend of that tree line? Yes, sir. What happened after you heard that first shot fire out? Uh, another shot followed after that from the same location, at which time uh, I returned fire into the area of the muzzle flashes. So how many shots did you hear total coming from that, that area where my cursor is before, before you returned fire? I heard two total at the time, uh, and then with uh, Deputy Brooks and I returning fire, it, I couldn't hear much after that. Were you, were you yourself able to see a person at that point, or was it just a, a muzzle flash? Just a muzzle flash, sir. And what type, of, um, what type of gun were you firing there that night, Deputy Mandel? Uh, SIG handgun, 357 caliber. 357? Yes, sir. And do you recall what type of gun Deputy Brooks had? Same gun. Um, how about Deputy Simmons? Can you tell where he is, what's going on with him at this point? After the second shot, uh, and we returned fire. He had uh, tried to evade, uh, and his, I think his dog got tied up in this, uh, or he got tied up in his dog leash or something. And he was able to recover from that, and he pushed behind us about 15, 20 yards. Were you able to tell if he and the, and the dog were okay at that Not point? at that point, no, sir. And when you hear these two gunshots ring out, what, kind of, what, what's your reaction, sir? We've been ambushed. After... Um, after Deputy Simmons was able to get behind you, um, and you and Deputy Brooks have returned fire, what's what's the situation then? At that point, uh, I told those guys to turn out their lights because we didn't want to light ourselves up because we didn't know where the suspect was at that point. I asked Deputy Canoose to cover the wood line in the wooded area so that he wasn't able to sneak up on us through the woods, and Deputy Brooks and I covered the front. And then at that point, we were trying to um, talk to Simmons to see if he was okay. Where are you at this point in terms of relationship to the, to the field, sir? Uh, at the point we took fire, uh, as I was firing, I pressed up about 10 yards. Deputy Brooks did the same on my left, and then Deputy Canoose did the same. He fell up to the right side of me. Are, so you, we, are you in the field at this point? We're right at the field's edge, up okay. against the uh, grass line to hit the woods. Do you have any, or is there any cover for you at this point? There's no cover. Okay. Um, and at this point, the suspect is still unknown to you? Yes, sir. His location. Other than the muzzle flashes, we didn't have anything else. Um, once you group back together, what happened at that point? I began to announce uh, Wake County Sheriff's Office, drop your weapon, throw your hands up, and announce your presence. Did anyone do that? Nobody. Nobody replied. I made multiple attempts. What happened next? Uh, we were contacting the team to let them know the approach pattern so that they wouldn't walk up on the suspect and also get ambushed. So in that, we were talking to them and gave them some quick light flashes to let them see our location so they could approach us. And when you say the other responding officers, was that Lieutenant Bird and? Lieutenant Bird and the team he brought with them. You talked a little bit about the flashlight stuff. Did Why did y'all have your flashlights off to start with out, out there? It's it's easier. Your eyes can become acclimated to the dark, and it was easier for us just to, with the moonlight, not to use a flashlight unless you saw something you had to identify and weren't able to do so in the dark. Uh, it helps not give away our position, so we can try to avoid things like being ambushed. So uh, we choose not to use the light as much as possible unless it's absolutely necessary. When that that light came on um, from Deputy Simmons, was that the first time a, a flashlight had been had been shown? Not the entire time, but it was, you know, Deputy Simmons apparently saw something he wanted to identify and he, when he activated his lights when the shot rang out. 
once uh, Lieutenant Byrd and his and the rest of the team arrived, what happened at that point, sir? Uh, at that point, I asked Lieutenant Byrd if Deputy Knust and I could push out into the field to try and get a better angle on a, on the uh, target location and see if uh, we could illuminate him at that point and both converge at the same time if he was there or at least see where he, if he was in the area still. And, and were you able to identify the suspect and the defendant at that point? At that time, uh, Deputy Knust and I pushed out into the field. Uh, we did a count with the other team, activated the light, and we could see a subject laying on the ground near the wood line. What, where were these lights that you activated, sir? Uh, mine was a handheld uh, weapon light, and I think uh, Deputy Canoose's was a rifle-mounted weapon light. Where was the suspect when you, when you saw him there in the wood line? Uh, laying on the edge of the field up against the wood line. Okay. And what, condition, what condition was he in? At that point, we didn't know. I assumed that he'd been hit, but at that point, we, none of us knew, so we began to approach from both sides. Was he moving or anything? Not at all. When you approached, what did you see? Uh, the subject was laying there unconscious uh, with the weapon slightly off his right hand on the ground. Was he responsive to you in any way? No, sir. I gave commands. He did not respond. Were you able to handcuff him at that point? Yes, sir. Uh, myself and another uh, SRT member handcuffed him. And how, how did you have to go about, about handcuffing him at that time? <clears throat> we physically had to grab his arms and put him on his back because he was, was not responding. Did any, at any point did he make any statements to you while while you were while you were handcuffing him? No, sir. How close? When you say that gun was right off his right hand, how how close was it? Was it was just a few inches. Were you able to see any um, shell casings or projectiles there when when you arrested the defendant? No, sir. I did not. Okay. a series of photographs that were previously introduced by my CCBI agent, um, but states exhibits 141, 140, 139, 137, 147, and 146, and then also states exhibits number 138 and 149. Take a look. Take a look at those two different groups of photographs, and tell me if you recognize what those photographs are. They appear to be the uh, shoot location scene. Permission to publish these photographs, Your Honor, using the overhead projection. Yes, sir. I just want to ask you a few questions about a few of these photographs. Um, Deputy Manville, get there in just a second. This is a this photograph of States Exhibit 137. Can you kind of describe for us what you see there, sir? Uh, it's the edge of the field. If you uh, we would have been walking from the direction you're looking at now toward the camera at the time of the shooting. So in other words, you would have been have been coming towards us. If, yes, sir. Toward the I... toward the camera or toward the view where it's coming from. There's a, I guess, a, some sort of light in the in the background, whether that's the moon or or some other object uh, illuminating there in the in the background. Um, that would have been behind you. Yes, sir. Okay. And so when you come around this cur this curve, that's the view looking back in toward towards the direction you were coming from. Yes, sir. I'm going to show you a photograph that I'll, I'll admit is, is kind of blurry, but it states Exhibit 141. Oh, 
that's, that's the blurry photograph that I was talking about. It appears there's a, a patrol vehicle or um, a, a flashlight of some sort in that curve. Is that the direction you were you were coming from? Yes, sir. And does that, I guess that photograph, does that kind of help depict that, how that was a, a blind curve for y'all when you came, came around the corner there? Yes, sir, it does depict a blind curve. And when you see that photograph, can you kind of show the members of the jury where Deputy Simmons would have been and yourself and um, also <clears throat> the, the other members of your team there? Deputy Simmons would have been about 15 to 20 yards out into the field from the edge there. Uh, Deputy Canoose would have been right up against the uh, wood line almost. I would have been just to the right of what you see as the trail there, to the right of that. And Deputy Brooks would have been a little bit farther out into the field from me. Almost, we, well, we run like a triangle or a wedge uh, behind the canine to make sure we're able to cover, cover the uh, areas as he's tracking. And at some point, I believe you said that you ended up back out in the field with the other members of your team um, immediately prior to locating the suspect? Yes, sir. Deputy Canoost and I pushed out into the field to get a different view. And I'm going to show you what has been marked as, or previously entered as 138. What do you see there, sir? That uh, appears to be the view that we had as we turned on our lights, okay. Deputy Canoose and I, as we were out in the field. Okay. So Deputy Canoose and yourself were out in the middle of the field looking back back towards the wood line? Yes, sir. And this got, this kind of shows the area in which you, you and the other deputies were, I guess, kind of out in the open without any cover? Yes, sir. The yellow flags that you see there, do you, do you recall what those yellow flags marked? No, sir. That was, that was after I cleared the scene. Okay. Is that the general area that you um, found the defendant that night? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, Deputy Manville. I don't have any further questions at this time. Cross-examination. Yes, sir. Um, Deputy Manville, when you went out, um, you said you heard two shots coming from the area where the, the, um, the suspect was? Yes, sir. Okay, and then you returned fire, correct? Yes, sir. I returned fire, Deputy Brooks and Deputy Simmons after that. Do you remember that? Did you, do you recall that you returned six shots? Yes, sir, approximately six. Okay, and the others returned uh, uh, stiffened no numbers, but they each returned some shots? Yes, sir. Um, you were not injured? No, sir, I was not. Uh, were there any other officers you were with injured? No, sir. Okay, thank you. I have no more questions. Redirect. Just a few, Your Honor. That last photograph that I showed where you could see the three flags in, in the wood line, how far away um, from your position was that area, sir? From the field position or the position that initial shots rang out? Uh, well, we'll start with that last one, the field position. <clears throat> Probably 20 yards, 25 yards. And then that, that position from where the shots originally fired out? I think it was a little bit farther than that, maybe 25 to 30. Okay. So 20, 20 while in the field, and then 25 to 30 from your location um, when the f shots were first fired? Yes, sir, that's an estimate in the dark. So. And what time did you depart the scene there, sir? Sir, I don't recall what time it was. It wasn't long after that, after we did our, uh, our statements, we left the scene. Okay. Thank you, sir. I don't have any further questions. All right. Anything further? All right, thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a 15-minute recess until 10 minutes until 12. Please recall all the instructions I've previously given you. They continue to apply during this second phase of the trial. Please leave your notepads in the chairs. Gather in the deliberation room at 10 minutes until 12. Anything we need to take up before we recess? No, sir. We'll be in recess until 10 till 12.